Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Panoramic Bible Studies with David Eels. Greetings, saints. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. We have been studying um, Diablos the Slanderer and um, discovering what a terrible thing slander is going to be in these days that are coming. Slander, railing, reviling, great persecution is coming against the saints. Well, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you, Lord, to... uh, Give us your wisdom, Lord. Lord, we we understand that there is a great crucifixion coming in these days, and we also know that our Lord Jesus has borne the curse for us, Lord. If we could just give up our life in this world and die to self, manifest your Son so we could be so useful to our brethren around us, Lord. And Lord, uh, we know that just as in the past, um, slander is going to be a, and railing and reviling is going to be uh, uh, manifested more in these days than we've ever seen on this earth against the saints, because history always repeats. And Lord, we just ask you to help us to recognize it and deal with it, not have any part in it, Lord. Obey the rules that you've given us, O Lord, so that we won't be involved with the sons of perdition and in doing these evil things. Thank you so much, Lord, for your grace and your mercy towards us, and your your gift in our hearts, Lord, to uh, walk in obedience to our Savior. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I'd like to share some a little bit here in the book of Jude with you concerning this. You know, In the book of Jude, we're told in verse 1 that Jude is speaking to the called of God. And he was writing to them in verse 3 of their common salvation. So he is talking about Christians here. He's talking to Christians here. And he warns them in verse 4 that ungodly men would creep in and turn the grace of God into lasciviousness and would in effect deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And lasciviousness, of course, is a a license to live after the flesh, to do what you want, to follow the Jesus of your choosing, right, instead of the Jesus of the Bible. And so he warns the Christians of this, and then he gives an even dire, more dire warning in verse 5. He says, I desire to put you in remembrance that though you know all things once and for all, that the Lord, having saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Very true. And is it going to happen in our day? Certainly it is. Our great falling away is coming. And then he reminds them that the angels that kept not their own principality or their place, their position in God, right? Uh, He kept in everlasting bonds under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Um, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them having in like manner with these given themselves over to fornication and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example suffering the eternal punishment, the punishment of eternal fire. So he warns them, we have a place, and we don't want to leave our place as Christians, you know, as um, glories in the heavens, so to speak, you know. We have a place, and and yet we can leave it and um, not believe what's been sent to us from heaven. And he 
begins to speak about these railers, these revilers, these slanderers that I believe are going to be manifested leading up to the end time like never before. Matter of fact, this is speaking about leading up to the end time because he speaks about the Lord coming with his saints at the end of this text that we're talking about here. And so he says in verse 8, he said, Yet in like manner, these, speaking of the same people he was talking about, those who were saved but fell away and uh, didn't prove to be believers in the midst of their trials, like the Israelites who died in the wilderness and didn't make it to the promised land, right? In like manner, these also in their dreamings defile the flesh. You know what dreamings are. They're thoughts of your mind, right? Things that you may desire, things that you may be dreaming up concerning your enemies, uh, you know, just uh, things that aren't necessarily of God. In like manner, these also in their dreamings defile the flesh and set it not dominion and rail at dignities. Set it not dominion is something that's all the way through the Bible. The apostates always said it not dominion. God sent somebody that was so contrary to them, but so godly, that their fallen spirits weren't able to recognize them. Right? And they killed the prophets. And they ultimately killed the Son of God. And killed his apostles that he raised up. And on and on and on. And these people were all that were doing the killing were all called God's people. And so he warns us that these days are coming and, and this is going to happen. They'll set it not dominion. They'll rail at dignities. You know, dignities here is the word glories in the Greek. You know who the glories are, right? You know, we're all transformed into the image of Christ from glory to glory. So basically, you're talking about people here who are manifesting their God. They're manifesting sonship. And, um, and yet, the people of the world, the wicked Christians are railing against them, setting them at naught, like they have all ways throughout history. Nothing changes. It just happens with larger groups of people, but it doesn't change. But Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. So, you know, if Michael, the great archangel, the prince of God, doesn't bring a railing accusation against the devil, we certainly shouldn't see railing accusations against those people who want to bring down the, the true dominion of God, want to usurp the true dominion of God. And these apostates who think that you know, just climbing the corporate ladder is all they have to do to get to the top, and they don't mind stepping on you to get there. These people always put down dominion. And, and yet God doesn't permit this constant railing against the brethren because they're just ignorant of the truth. You know, the people that came with the dominion were spiritual. They walked in the spirit. They weren't carnal. The carnal people don't ever recognize the spiritual people because they don't see as they see. They don't have that discernment. You know, we are we are warned in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 that there is going to be a war against the saints and that the saints are going to be beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus that they hold. And we're told in Revelation 19 that the testimony of Jesus, in verse 10, is the spirit of prophecy. Well, in other words, there are people who don't have spiritual discernment. They only know the letter. And the people who have the letter are going to persecute those that have the spirit. It's the same today. And Paul told us that in Galatians 4. Nothing has changed. It's the same today. Him that's born after the flesh will persecute him that's born after the Spirit. That's what he said. It's the same today. 
Who is the ones that are doing the railing? Those that are born after the flesh who consider themselves to be judges and are so proud and arrogant and don't have eyes to see and the Lord don't let them see because they're sinners. And he says, The Lord rebuked thee. Didn't make a big thing out of it. He said, But these rail at whatsoever things they know not. The ones that do the railing. Look, look who did the railing in Jesus' day. You know, Look who did the railing in the time of the prophets. Look who did the railing. It was always those that didn't even know what they thought they knew. And that spirit that was coming out of them proved who they were, and it also proved who they weren't. And uh, it's always these people who have railed and set it not dominion and railed at people that were sent by God. And um, and what they understand naturally, there it is, what they saw in the letter. See, they saw the letter, the true people of God, that God trains and sends, they see in the Spirit. And even today, there is an overwhelming majority of Christianity that would rail at anything that you did that was scriptural. And uh, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life, right? He said, they understand naturally, like the creatures without reason. In these things are they destroyed. So, God is truly going to use these people to bring God's people to their cross, God's true people, His true spiritual people to their cross. But but when they're through doing their dirty work, um, they're going to be destroyed. And, and you know, destruction is something that um, happens in the spirit as well as in the flesh. You know, uh, there are people that are destroyed in the spirit. They they have no understanding, they have no eyes to see, they have no ears to hear. Uh, unto you it may be given to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it's not given, Jesus said. So, And in these things are they destroyed. Woe unto them, for they went in the way of Cain. You know, Cain was of the evil one, and he slew his brother, right? And ran riotously in the error of Balaam. Who was it that Balaam wanted to rail at? You know, Balaam, it says here, uh, they ran in the error of Balaam for hire. You know, Balaam was going to do whatever profited him. And he uh, truly wanted to prophesy against the people of God. He wanted to speak a, a curse upon the people of God. The only and it's not to his credit that every time he opened his mouth, the Word of God came out and blessed the people of God. That wasn't his ambition at all. And ultimately, the Bible even tells us, you know, that he, he taught them even when God wouldn't permit him to prophesy against the people of God. He taught their enemies how to cast a stumbling block in their path. So that this stubborn man didn't ever give up. You know, his uh, lust for the things of the world, which are very temporal, and have an end, you know. What what foolishness, you know. So today we got people that run riotously in the air of Balaam for hire. They'll do whatever pleases their flesh, whatever, you know, they have a fancy for. And perish in the gainsaying of Korah. What is gainsaying? Well, it's, disputing, it's striving, it's speaking evil against. Just what, just what we've been talking about. The gainsaying of Korah. Korah lusted for a position of authority, like many men do in the world. It's a natural thing, you know. Uh, but he was um, setting at naught dominion of Aaron and Moses. He was uh, usurping the place of Aaron and Moses. You know, he was a Levite. Dathan and Abiram, who were his cohorts, they were not Levites, but he was a Levite. He had a position in God as a minister of God. He wasn't satisfied with that. He wanted to be an apostle. He wanted to be somebody over 
ministers of God. He wanted to be, he wanted to take Moses' place or Aaron's place, the high priest, right? Many people want to take Christ's place in your life. They want to. And they'll try to. But as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. These people want to be your Lord. They want to be make disciples, make you disciples of them rather than disciples of Christ. And um, don't trust them. They'll identify themselves by their gainsaying. You know, and they're disputing and they're striving against others for this position that they want, right? And they're always speaking evil of other people to make themselves look good. That's what they think. But people with discernment understand that this is gainsaying and that this person is identifying themselves. And verse 12 says, These are they who are hidden rocks in your love feasts. Kind of like Judas was hidden among the twelve and they didn't know which one he was, you know. They questioned the Lord. Finally, he told them, it's the one who dips the sop with me, you know, the son of perdition, S-O-P, sop. And uh, these are they who are hidden rocks in your love feasts when they feast with you. Shepherds, which, by the way, is not in the original. There's no numeric pattern in shepherds because it's not just talking about shepherds here. Shepherds do. I mean, obviously, Korah and Balaam were, were shepherds, you know, but... He's not just talking to shepherds here. That without fear feed themselves. Many shepherds do feed themselves. Ezekiel 34 speaks about the real reason why the shepherds serve. They serve to feed themselves. They serve to feed their ego, to feed their pocketbook, to all these things. Their love is not for the sheep necessarily. It's for themselves. Clouds without water. You know, water represents the Word, doesn't it? Now, a cloud can represent the Spirit, but it also might represent a wrong spirit. A cloud without water. Carried along by the winds, you know, blown about by every wind of doctrine, Paul taught. You know? Autumn trees without fruit. In other words, they're not evergreens at all, are they? And they don't bear fruit either. And they become twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And would you know if they're twice dead and plucked up by the roots? How would you know that they are? I mean, they're still walking around. They're still doing their thing. You know, they still look pretty good, you know. But how would you know? Well, you'd have to be able to judge them the way the Scripture tells you to, you know. If they're bearing the fruit of Jesus, if they're, uh, obviously, if they're gainsaying, if they're railing, you know that this is not a child of God here. And um, wild waves of the sea, he calls them. You know, what's a wild wave, you know? It's not going in the direction it was made to go, according to nature. Foaming out their own shame, foaming. What is a, you ever seen the, the waves foam? It's usually because there's contamination there. It's not pure water, right? And that's the, that's the problem. It's what's coming out of their mouth is contamination. Wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness has been reserved forever. They don't keep their own principality, their own position in God, in the heavens. They, uh, they lust after something that's not given to them. And to these also Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes, came with ten thousands of his holy ones, to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their works of ungodliness which they have ungodly wrought and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And, and you know that Jesus said that whatsoever you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. If you do something against the true body of Christ, you've done it against him. Hard things are spoken by these wicked people that believe they are the people of God. He said, these are murmurers, complainers, 
walking after their lusts, and their mouth speaking great swelling words, showing respect of persons for the sake of advantage. Isn't that kind of a picture of apostate denominationalism? They have respect of persons. If you believe like them, fine. If you feed them, fine. If you put into their mouth, fine. If not, they'll make war against you, Micah said. Micah chapter 3, right? And in verse 19, he said, These are they that make separations. They have separations or like denominations, you know, for the sake of advantage. They separate people. These are they who make separations, sensual, not having the Spirit. And it's surprising how close um, Second Peter came to what Jude said here. It's uh, almost a parallel. There's a few things there that are that I think are important to our understanding of who these people are, especially in these days that we're coming to. This is going to be the worst time in all of history because so many of what we call the people of God are going to be reprobated just as they were when Jesus came, the first man-child came. So many of these people are going to be reprobated. And he says in Second Peter 2, he said, But there arose false prophets also among the people, as among you also there shall be false teachers who shall privily bring in destructive heresies. You know what heresies are, right? You'd be, well, you might be surprised what heresies are. Heresies are like um, very opinionated people who, for personal advantage, divide the people of God. You know, in order to gain a following, that's what a heresy is. You wouldn't know it. Not a lot of people think it's just real bad doctrine or something, you know. No, it's not. It's people that are factious. It's people that are gaining a following and creating a group. Follow them rather than Jesus. Uh, denying the master that bought them. You know, if you are taken captive by a false prophet, false teacher, how do you know what they look like anyway? False. Do they dress the same way? Yeah. Do they talk the same talk? Yeah. Oh, they, they know how to do that. Yeah, they know how to do that. So how do you know them? You'd have to know them by their fruit, but you don't get to judge their fruit that much because they're putting on a pretty good show, you know, when they're around Christians. It's hard to say. If you saw them in their home life, you probably would find out, you know. If you uh, could, you know, be a fly on the wall sometime, you could find out, but... They do a pretty good job of hiding that. But so you have to watch. You know, one thing they do, always do, because they cannot overcome sin, the Bible says. A little further on in this chapter, as a matter of fact. They can't overcome sin, so they have to try to hide their real self from you. And uh, But it says here, notice as we read on, it says, um, they deny the master that bought them. In other words, they... Do not submit to his lordship, right? And um, and bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and and many shall follow their lascivious doings. There, all of these people are lascivious. That means they have a license to do what they want to do. They don't have to follow the Lord. They deny the master. They deny the lordship of God over them. They're all lascivious. Therefore, their doctrines will be lascivious. They love these doctrines that permit you to do anything you want to do instead of uh, discipleship. They love it. And by reason of whom the way of the truth shall be evil spoken of. Now, this word here, these words here, evil spoken of, these are the same words that are translated railing. The word for railing means evil spoken of. This is the same word further down. I'll point it out to you in just a minute. It says, And in covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Have you ever heard feigned words? They're not natural. They don't flow out of a person naturally. They're, they're putting on a show. Have you ever seen the show? If you can't see through that, you need some discernment, right? 
feigned words. They make merchandise of you. In other words, they're buying and selling you with their words, right? They're capturing you. They're bringing you into captivity. And he goes on to say, Whose sentence now from of old lingereth not, and their destruction slumbereth not. Then it goes on to say the same thing in Jude, that, that God didn't spare the angels when they got out of their position, you know. I want to jump down to verse 9. It says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Now, these people that he's talking about, they fall headlong into their temptations and they get caught and they, and they are seen by people. Cannot overcome sin, it says a little later here. Um, he knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and keep the unrighteous under punishment unto the day of judgment. That means they're being punished all the time. He keeps them there keeps them under punishment. He said, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lusts of defilement and despise dominion. The people who are most railing at dominion despise it. If they met Jesus, they would not like him. They uh, don't really like the people who are in heaven yet they fancy themselves like God and uh, that God approves of them. You know, this is uh, a strong delusion. You know? um, but they despise dominion. They're daring and they're self-willed and they tremble not to rail at dignities or glory. Same word as we saw before. In other words, those who are manifesting Christ, they rail at glories. Whereas angels, though greater in might, and power bring not a railing judgment against them before the Lord. But these are creatures without reason, born mere animals, to be taken and destroyed. You know, then they preachers are fond of saying, you know, that man is a greater creation than the animals, that uh, man has a soul, man has a spirit, but the animals do too. Scripturally, if you look at the Hebrew words there, Greek words there, you see that the animals do too, contrary to their opinion. But when you talk about unregenerate man, he's an animal. He's following after his flesh. He's following after his instincts. Yet some of these animals are, are more, have actually more fruit than many people that are called Christians. There are good people in the world that are better people than some people that are called Christians. Have you ever noticed? That doesn't put them in the kingdom because, because self-righteousness is all you can ever have without God's righteousness. And self-righteousness, even though it looks pretty good in the world, uh, it won't save you. And so, but these people are mere animals. They're soulish. And he says, to be taken and destroyed. That's God's opinion of these people, these railers. They're just made to be taken and destroyed. When they're finished doing what they're, they're doing, which is persecuting the righteous, casting down dominions, destroying the foundations, as we saw earlier, then they're going to be destroyed. Railing in matters whereof they are ignorant. The word railing there is the same word we looked at up further up here. Uh, evil spoken of. That's the same exact Greek word. Railing in matters whereof they are ignorant shall in their destroying surely be destroyed. While they're destroying others, they are being destroyed. God is reprobating them. He is rejecting them from his kingdom. Suffering wrong is the hire of wrongdoing. Men that count it pleasure to revel in the daytime, spots and blemishes. You know, but the true bride, of course, is going to be spotless and blemishless, right? I've, I've heard that spots are new sins and blemishes are old sins, right? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, um, reveling in their deceivings while they feast with you. Yeah, they are deceiving you. They're trying to look holy in front of you, and they're anything but. 
having eyes full of adultery, or literally the adulterer. So you know what problems the people in authority seem to have with this. It's awesome that God is revealing these people, you know, in these days especially. And of course there's also spiritual adultery too because, you know, we've been, we've been given to one husband, right? And they cannot cease from sin. They cannot cease from sin. They can put on a pretty good show, but they cannot cease from sin. Enticing unsteadfast souls having a heart exercised in covetousness. Notice that's the same thing you just got through speaking about earlier in verse 3. And in covetousness shall they, um, with feigned words, make merchandise of you. You know, covetousness, I think it's oleonectes is the, the uh, Greek word, it means just desiring more. They're never satisfied. You know, Isaiah called them greedy dogs. They can never have enough. And it doesn't matter if it's enough to, you know, keep their ego or whether it's talking about physical things. They can never have enough. They are full of covetousness. Children of cursing. You know, the Bible says he loved cursing and it came unto him. You know, those that love cursing, they will be cursed. Forsaking the right way and they went astray, uh, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the hire of wrongdoing, and on and on. Let me look at, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul was on the bad end of these people quite a few times. His doctrines are quite misunderstood, you know, uh, like anybody who speaks the truth today. These They twist, they pervert words. You know, the Apostle Paul complained in Romans chapter 3 and verse 8. He says, And why not, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose condemnation is just. You know, we never see this doctrine in the Apostle Paul, but somebody has perverted his doctrine to the extent you you don't understand, you can't see what he's saying, you know. And even today, there are people out that sit out there that don't understand. They're like animals. They don't understand. They don't perceive. And they judge dignities who are people who have paid the price to know the truth and who speak the truth. Um, they judge these people. And... Um, they pervert their words, they twist their words, they say things about them that are not so. And Paul says their condemnation is just. We see constantly through the New Testament the pattern of the things that are coming. Um, you know, in the book of Acts, for instance, we see um, the same thing happening. And, you know, we've got our own book of Acts coming. Everything that happened in Acts is going to happen again, uh, except on a worldwide scale. Acts is a story um, also of the latter time church. This was the Acts of the former reign, but we're coming to the Acts of the latter reign. And um, this time it's going to be even worse. Men are going to be more reprobate. Leaders of religion are going to uh, make war on the saints. You know, in Acts 17, let me just read to you uh, verse 1 through about 8, okay? It says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul as his custom was, went in unto them, and for three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the Scriptures, opening and alleging that it, it behooved the Christ to suffer and to rise again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom said he, I proclaim unto you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, 
a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. Well, this is interesting. You know, Greeks, of course, weren't the people of God, but the people of God were rejecting him. People of the world were coming in and receiving, you know. And it says in verse 5, But the Jews, being moved with jealousy, took unto them certain vile fellows of the rabble, and gathering a crowd, set the city on an uproar. You know, but the Jews, the people who should have known, should have been able to see and understand this deeper revelation of their Savior, Christ, uh, did not and railed against the Apostle Paul and and Silas and uh, moved with jealousy. You know, one of the major spirits behind railing and reviling and attacking in these days is going to be jealousy. You know, God is going to send a revival. He's going to send the latter rain. He's going to send reformers to bring the church back to her roots. And the same thing that happened back then is going to happen now. And that is that the Christians this time, not the Jews, but the Christians this time, because now they are the people of God, are going to be jealous because of the move of God through these people. And of course, they're going to rail, they're going to raise up trouble, they're going to raise up crowds, they're going to come against the people of God. They set the city in an uproar and assaulting the house of Jason, they sought to bring them forth to the people. And Jason, of course, was one who had received the revelation and uh, was being persecuted. And when they found them, not, they dragged Jason and certain brethren before the rulers of the city, crying, These have turned the world upside down. Do you think that in these days the Lord is going to do that? You better believe it. He's going to turn the world upside down, the religious world upside down. And uh, they're not going to like it. They're going to fight furiously against it. And The more they do, as we just got through reading, the more they do, the more they're going to be reprobated and become mere beasts, mere animals. Turn the world upside down and came hither also, whom Jason hath received. Would that they all had received, right? And these all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Very interesting. Now they want them to obey the beast saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Of course, this is, again, seeing things in the letter, seeing things naturally. They're accusing them of things that are not true. You know, of course, Jesus was a king, but not a king to be ruler in this world, you know, but the next, and to rule in our spirits, right? And they troubled the multitude and the rulers of the city when they heard these things great persecution raised up and we see of Jesus' predicament with these people back in Matthew 26 he says in verse 57 and they that had taken Jesus led him away to the house of Caiaphas the high priest where the scribes and elders were gathered together but Peter followed him afar off unto the court of the high priest and entered in and sat with the officers to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council sought false witness against Jesus, the same as they have throughout history, right? They sought false witness against Jesus that they might put him to death. I just came from a trial recently where false witness were sought against Christians who were attempting to walk out their faith. They sought false witnesses against Jesus that they might put him to death, and they found it not. 
though many false witnesses came. But afterwards came two. In other words, the problem was in one of the other Gospels is that they weren't agreeing. Their testimony wasn't agreeing. They were all false witnesses, but they couldn't get it together, you know. And they were getting caught in their lies. But afterward came two and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Now, he didn't say that at all, did he? No. He said, destroy this temple. And he spake of the temple of his body. And in three days, I'm able to raise it up. And by the way, the temple of his body is being raised up here on the third day, isn't it? So, I mean, we can see in the spirit what Jesus was talking about, but they were using the letter like beasts who only understand naturally and they're going to use their letter to persecute those who have the spirit of prophecy which is the testimony of Jesus right so they falsely accused Jesus and the high priest stood up and said unto him answerest thou nothing what is it that these witnesses against thee these witness against thee but Jesus held his peace he, he knew there really wasn't any answer to give these people you know they had no eyes to see how can you explain to them you know and the high priest said unto him I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou art the Christ the son of God and uh, Jesus saith unto him thou hast said Nevertheless, I say unto you, henceforth you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his garment, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. Well, it's really the other way around, isn't it? They spoke blasphemy. They railed, blasphemio, railed at him. And and what he, he knew what he was talking about. He knew where he was from. He knew where he was going to. And they didn't know that. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they answered and said, He is worthy of death. Yep, according to their letter and according to their law, he was worthy of death. But they had twisted his words. They had not seen in the Spirit. They understood naturally. And so they became persecutors. And so it is today, folks. Everything that happened in the Gospels and in the book of Acts is going to happen again in our day. And in our day, people that only see naturally, that don't see in the Spirit, they're going to persecute those that are born after the Spirit. He is worthy of death. You know, it behooves us to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath because we understand so little. God is able to open our eyes He's able to help us to see, but we got to be willing. And if we're only willing to attack others and rail and blaspheme, then God will never give us any understanding because we're unforgiving. And if you're unforgiving, he turns you over to the tormentors. What he said. Then did they spit in his face and buffet him and smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ. Who is he that struck thee? Well, it's the same story over and over and over. You know, we um, we see in the book of Micah, for instance, chapter 3. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people to err, that bite with their teeth and cry, Peace! And whosoever putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. These are um, self-willed, ambitious people, you know. Therefore, it shall be night unto you, that you shall have no vision. In other words, they'll understand even less of what the truth is and what the true people look like and what Jesus himself is and what he looks like, right? They'll understand even less because God's going to take away their vision. And it shall be dark unto you, and you shall not divine. And the sun shall go down upon the prophets, and the day 
shall be black over them. And the seers shall be put to shame, and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. But as for me, of course Micah here represents the true prophet, right? But as for me, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment, and of might, to declare unto Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. Now that can get you in a lot of trouble there, can it? <laughs> to declare unto to Israel their sin, right? Declare unto the people of God their sin. The apostates can't do that. Many of the people that call themselves prophets and teachers and pastors in these days are the kind we're talking about right now. Many of them. And um, they're stubborn, they're self-willed. They uh, take dominion that's not theirs. They take authority over people that don't belong to them. They have their own selfish ambition. They're building their own kingdom. And just as Jesus gave in his parable about coming to receive the fruits of his vineyard, they, they killed him and they'll kill anybody that's sent by him. If not physically, then spiritually, verbally, you know, railing and all these things. You know, the, the Roman governor told them to go and crucify Jesus themselves. He said, we have a, our law is against that. Well, doesn't that, isn't the Christian law the same? It's against that. So they politically twisted the arm of the government to do it for them, you know. It's uh, very interesting. And I'm thinking about uh, also the story of um, in uh, 1 Kings 21 is very similar to the story of Jesus. And I believe it's a prophetic revelation for our time. It's the story of Naboth. You remember the story how that uh, the beast who was uh, Ahab, who was the ruler over the apostate northern ten kingdoms, so you got a beast with ten horns here, and um, he wanted Naboth's vineyard. He said in verse 2, he said, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs. So he didn't want to bear any fruit there, did he? A garden of herbs, because it's near unto my house, and I will give thee it for it a better vineyard. And Or if it seem good unto thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. So the beast wanted Nabo's vineyard. Do you know that that's exactly what the beast wants of us? They, they don't want us to have the fruit of Christ in our vineyard. They want to plant their own seed in our vineyard, and it won't bring forth any fruit, just like this one. And Naboth said, and said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And it's so true. The inheritance of our forefathers is what was passed down to us in these scriptures, right? And it's also what bears fruit in our vineyard, the fruit of Jesus Christ. They want that. They hate that fruit to be planted there. They want to plant their own seed there that doesn't bring forth any fruit, right? And God forbids that we give them this land that we live in, this heart of ours that bears the fruit of Jesus Christ. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the, the Jezreelite had spoken to him. And, and Naboth the Jezreelite means the fruits that God will sow. That's what it means. Naboth, the fruits. Jezreelites that God will sow. The fruits that God will sow. So, basically, the beast is after your fruit. Whatever it is that looks like Jesus Christ, they hate. The world, the wicked world, they hate. They will come against it. They want to give you what they believe. They want to sow their seed in your vineyard. And Naboth wasn't willing to give it up. I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. Well, Jezebel, the harlot, was willing to take it from him. 
And uh, once again, we see the story of Jesus and the crucifixion here, you know. Jezebel told Ahab, don't worry about it. You know, you go your own way and on your, your own happy way, and I will give you um, the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. She said that down in verse 7. So she wrote letters in, in Ahab's name. You know that the harlot is going to have the authority of the beast. You know, when they raise up a new world order religion, they're going to give that new world order religion authority over you. Just like the Sanhedrin was given authority over Jesus by the Roman government. Same thing. Going to be given authority. And he sealed them with his seal. Let's see, she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders, to the nobles that were in the city that dwelt in uh, with Naboth. And she wrote in letters saying, Proclaim a fast, set Naboth on high among the people, and set two men, base fellows, before him. So just because you got two witnesses don't mean that they're reliable witnesses, right? They weren't for Jesus. They weren't for Naboth. You know, um, they have to be reliable people. And let them bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst curse God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him to death. And the men of the city, because they were members of the harlot too, um, even the elders and the nobles who dwelt in the city, did as Jezebel sent unto them, according to as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. They proclaimed a fast, set Naboth on high among the people, and the two men, the base fellows, came in and sat before him, and the base fellows bare witness against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did curse God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him to death with stones. Then they went they sent to um, Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that uh, Jezebel said unto Ahab, Arise and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, and to take possession of it. And the word of the Lord came unto Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, and go down, and meet Ahab, king of Israel, who dwelleth in Samaria. And behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he is gone down to take possession of it. And you know probably the rest of the story, that... Um, the Lord knew exactly what the beast was doing and pronounced judgment on the beast and on the harlot, spoke about them being devoured by the dogs, and um, on and on. And, and it came to pass, just as, as was said. And, you know, the story is also with Joseph. You remember how Joseph... All these are stories that are prophetic and have their fulfillment in our day. You, you remember how Joseph also, you know, was um, in Potiphar's house and uh, the harlot lied about him, saying that he had had relations with her or attempted to have relations with her, and he was thrown into prison. And Joseph, of course, was a type of Jesus uh, who was sold into bondage for silver and... Um, and was cast into prison because of the harlot had lied against him. And in the prison, of course, Jesus preached to the spirits in prison, and just like Joseph did. And Joseph um, uh, separated between those that were going into the kingdom and those that were going into the pit, and the, the butler and the baker, right? And uh, so the story there is really about Jesus and about the end times and about the body of Christ too. You know, what we've seen about Jesus is also true about the body of Christ. You know, Jesus, after his three and a half year ministry, uh, was crucified and in the coming tribulation, there is a crucifixion coming for the body of Christ by the beast and by the harlot. So you see, remember that Jesus was an individual 
And then in the spirit, he became a body. And he told that body, you know, except you take up your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciples. So we are following Jesus to a death here. Uh, the world is cooperating to help us to our cross. Everybody's not going to go to a physical death, but everybody's going to a death. And it is definitely a death to self. Praise be to God. And Joseph, of course, too, before he became ruler over everything, um, went to his spiritual death. He went to prison and was lied about, falsely accused, slandered. Uh, will it be the same for us? Yes, it will. For every one of us will be slandered, will be lied about by the wicked and by the wicked church, if you can call them the church. They're really not because the church is the called out ones, but but those that call themselves Christians, you know, we will be lied about. We will be slandered. We will be railed upon and reviled, falsely accused. Um, this is one way you will know the righteous. You know, they are going to be the ones who are falsely accused. And the carnal Christians will always join with the beast government against them. Praise be to God. Well, we've run out of time, but we'll take up here next time by the grace of God, if he says so, right? God bless you. For more information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com.